turns from present in the past Every week will be an animated bash Woo! What a cartoon What a cartoon Maybe a short but mostly shows We'll talk, we'll analyze, exploring as we go What a cartoon Hello, everybody, and welcome to Water Cartoon, the podcast hosted by two guys who will walk through the wall if you want us to. I'm one of your hosts, the man with a functional gum bombiter, Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today, as always. Hey, it's Henry Gilbert, and this podcast calls for milk and crackers. Yummy, and today's episode is all about the Gumby cartoon moon trip. I was on the moon, but I'm sure glad to be back, mother. Spoilers, Gumby <laughs> went to the moon and came back. And this comes to us from James Eldred, one of our high-tier patrons. James has no uh, official statement as to why he chose Gumby, but presumably he is a Gumby fan or at least wants to hear us talk about the Gumbmeister. I know in our uh, Discord, which, hey, if you're a Patreon supporter, get on the Discord. It's a lot of fun. I know there have been waves and waves of Gumby discussions in the G- Discord, also because just like random Gumby screens are just funny to look at. Yes. In fact, it's weird that or interesting that James chose this around this time because I've been following the Twitter account Gumby Screens mm-hmm. just because the, he'll just post random uh, screenshots from Gumby and they're all pretty funny. And I've been sending them to my wife, Nina, just for like for chuckles. <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about Gumby and my own history with Gumby. So I'm very glad that James chose this for uh, this uh, one of his selections. Yeah. I, uh, you know, me growing up with Gumby, I was a viewer as a kid. I guess I, I liked him. But- but I, I said this a lot in a Rocky and Bullwinkle podcast, but I think it's a similar situation here where my mom grew up loving Gumby. And then when the reruns started coming around in my childhood, she's like, oh, watch Gumby. That was one of my favorites, like just like uh, with Bullwinkle. And so uh, I watched now after looking at like the seasons of Gumby, yeah. I can now identify that I was watching the 80s new episodes and repackaging uh, ones and I knew I knew the 80s intro and all that and also I closely associate watching Gumby with the taste of armor hot dogs mm, you were the uh, kind of kid who loved armor hot dogs I did I didn't climb on rocks too much but I did like them were they I, cut up into pieces uh, actually no because I just think of this it was this weird ritual I had watching Gumby I think in one Gumby episode a uh, character hobo style had a hot dog on a stick full hot dog and just ate it that way and i asked my mom make me just a one plain hot dog i will put the fork in the center of it and i will eat Mm. it like a hobo uh, uh, with it hanging off of the stick. that was an imitatable act by uh, gumby there Uh, so that's you know the very specific and certainly unnatural flavor of armor hot dogs (laughs) i think of that when i think of gumby I have Gumby experience, so I don't know if it was before or after the 80s revival, but back in the day of the VHS rental shop, uh, when I was a small child, the the kids rentals were 99 cents, so I would just rent a ton of videos when it was video time, and a lot of them were these Gumbies, and the one that I chose to look at for this episode, Moon Trip, is the one that definitely left an impression on me, perhaps gave me nightmares, (laughs) but yes, I watched a lot of the VHS tapes when they released in the late 80s, I watched the 80s revival series, and then when I became a bit old and a bit savvier and you know watching naughty cartoons like Ren and Stimpy and Beavis and Butthead Gumby came back on Nickelodeon Mm. and at that point in history I was watching Gumby ironically right yes and (laughs) which is the way most people watch Gumby now yeah you know when I was looking up old commercials for Gumby I saw like it was a a perfect nostalgia box Bullwinkle and then Gumby or Gumby then Bullwinkle like that's perfect watch it with mom and dad after work kind of uh, block for it or for the aging into 13 14 kids who who also watch eureka's castle ironically too and weirdly enough gumby has been just wiped from the face of the earth for the past 25 years nobody cares about gumby (laughs) i tried like what is new gumby merchandise of course there are like little bendable toys those never went away but nina and i have found that all of the gumby merchandise we found that's wearable is oddly sexual so Mm. there is a t-shirt this is official merch as far as i could tell there's a t-shirt with gumby and pokey and it says 
friends with benefits. What the hell? And uh, there's like a shirt with Pokey that says, want to ride me or something like that. Whoa. So Gumby has been reinvented to be like crudely sexual in the uh, in the 21st century. Man, that's uncomfortable. I, uh, it's weird. I guess, you know, this is what happens, though, if you don't sell out to a giant company. Like the fact. Yeah, the, it's the, still a family brand. <laughs> I guess that's what happens, too, with Gumby. I honestly, I I was shocked. to. The, sorry, this is getting to the end of the history, but I'm, I'm shocked even to this day that Gumby just didn't sell to somebody like Viacom. I'm you would be certain even then in the nineties, Viacom probably would have said like, "Can we just own Gumby? Like, just give us Gumby. We nope. we want it." <laughs> Prima Vision still owns Gumby, uh, the the cloaky company. But I, I had the toys too. Uh, but and and when you mentioned the VHSs, yes, that instantly. I I don't think I rented them because I got all the Gumby on TV. I could take, but <laughs> I I definitely can recall walking down the kids video section and the the giant white plastic gumby vhs tapes like gumby right there going like hey you want to rent me gumby now i can't not think of these when uh, i think of the mst3k short they did for robot rumpus yes (laughs) and i will say i have gumby preferences i'm a weirdo i'm a psycho and i prefer certain eras of gumby and that's why we're covering one of the earliest gumby shorts because i feel we'll we'll discuss why this is but i feel like the 50s gumbies are the more experimental shorts the more uh at times psychedelic shorts the more kind of frightening and terrifying shorts because in the 60s he became a marketable figure Mm -hmm. super marketable and that's the gumby i don't like but we're going to zero in on the weird funky gumby who will uh send you to your bed full of uh, nightmare fuel i often think of uh wh- doing notes for this i was thinking of mike nelson's line of close-ups reveal the weakness of the whole premise <laughs> this squares my breasts yes yeah <laughs> uh let's talk about the history of gumby and by the way almost all of gumby is just on amazon prime and it's neatly divided into the different eras of gumby and it's all been like beautifully remastered as good yeah. as this will ever look it's there. It's amazing. I, I couldn't believe and And also, like, that Kabillion channel has it on YouTube, if you go on there, mm-hmm. or a lot of this stuff. But, yeah, I, on the Prime video, how well it was sectioned off, like, that most properties that age... Uh, and, and of that lack of fame right now, don't get that kind of treatment on uh, on Prime Video or other streaming services. It's true. So I did a bunch of research for this, as I always do. And then I found like, oh, there's this Gumby documentary about the creator. It's available on uh, YouTube for free. It's called Gumby Dharma. And I was like, oh, I'll just watch this too. And I found everything I needed to know from that documentary. Surprisingly, the information in that documentary is not represented on the wiki articles or in any mm. other thing I've seen. So if you want to know as much as you ever could ever know about Art Cloakey, the creator of Gumby, watch uh, Gumby Dharma. It's oddly touching, and he had led an interesting life, and we'll talk about it on this podcast. I am so glad you, because uh, I could just hear this information from you on here, but I'm so glad you suggested I watch Gumby Dharma because I learned quite a lot, and like I, I watched it with my husband, and I'd say once every ten minutes we said what what like there's a new detail of of the life he led and some like and that w- what a life art cloaky led like it's it's not what you would expect from we learn about all these guys who are like oh i was the creator of this and he was like a businessman or whatever yeah. or he got rich or he was like yeah he was a guy who drank a three martini lunch and voted republican <laughs> like that's who that guy was that's not art cloaky at all no so let's talk about him art cloaky the creator of gumby was born Arthur Charles Farrington in 1921, by the way, he passed away in 2010 at 88. So a very, very long life. But boy, his life is full of ups and downs. And it started with a lot of downs because (laughs) as a kid, uh, his dad went on a business trip. And while his dad was gone, his mom fell in love with a local police officer. And so when dad came back, there was a new couple in town and his wife was part of it. So there was a divorce. (laughs) Art went to live with his dad across the country. Then his dad died. So Art comes back to live with his mom and this police officer uh, stepfather. Turns out the guy's like, you look too much like the man your wife, my wife used to love. So we're just going to give you up to a children's home because Uh, during the depression, I have to assume things are different now, but it's like you're in the depression. You're like, I don't know what to do with this kid. You take uh, him. Take him, nuns. I'll send him to your... No, that I couldn't believe that. Like the story, it's also what's like not said in that 
that's that you have to like yeah re- because definitely it sounds like that that cop who came into things he sounds like an incredibly controlling like monster who like mind controlled this woman or, or like abused her until she agreed to give yeah. away her son like it's me or your son get yeah, rid of him that's what art says in the in the documentary he's like yeah it's either me or him and it's like well it turned out to be me so i had oh. to go live at a children's yeah. home well and they they make it sound like he um the father was so heartbroken like he uh, like that led to his death too mm. it seems that it seemed to me they were talking around a suicide uh, like you didn't call it a suicide if if a fa- if a man died like that back then but god cloaky just given away by your father is dead and then your mother says I got to get ready. Uh, Turns sorry. out your mother's not around either. Oh, how by did, choice to be given away by your own mother. Like after, after losing your father, like that would break most people. And yet he created the lovable character Gumby yes. much later in life. So, uh, when he was 11, he was adopted by a man named Joseph Clokey, which is where he got his last name. And this new father figure gave him a love of the arts and culture. Like he was, he was adopted by the right guy. Yeah. That's, that shows, you know, what it turned, hey, you adopted by anybody else. There's no Gumby. No way. <laughs> and also because of this new father figure, he developed a love of filmmaking because his father had one of the first like personal 16 millimeter cameras and they went on a ton of trips together. And in the documentary, you can see like very old footage of them, like in the thirties, possibly early forties traveling together to like the Arctic circle and places like that. It's very sweet. It sounds like he really did, um, you, most stories about adoptions in the 1930s don't end like happily you know <laughs> so before gumby life before gumby he goes to uh, miami university in ohio yes there is a miami in ohio it's just as bad as miami in florida don't go there <laughs> yeah, at least you got beaches in miami florida that's true you got nothing in miami in ohio uh so yeah he goes there gets a bachelor's degree then he goes to a uh, seminary school because he wants to become an episcopal priest mm. and that is where he meets his first wife ruth uh ruth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, basically, the uh, another like an undisclosed creator of Gumby. So yeah, that really it is a co-creator scenario yeah. with those two. Yeah. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this, but I feel like there's some strong Jim Henson vibes to this guy because just like Jim Henson, uh, he gets his you know big first hit in the fifties. Of course, his wife is a huge part of that, and then. Uh, he says, I don't like this wife anymore, uh, but you still get no credit. So that's kind of yeah. what happens. And we'll talk a bit about that later. But I see like some same big vibes between these two guys. I feel like Art, he was always in over his head with this Gumby stuff. I feel like Jim was the more talented guy. But in terms of their yeah. domestic relationships, I see some big similarities. And they are, you know, creative types who have a christian upbringing background like yeah, you know yes. b- they both henson and his wife were also you know they they were a christian couple like he was a christian scientist i, I don't believe cloaky was a christian scientist but to be an episcopalian minister like or to train for it uh and, and then they also i think they both had this feeling of like they were button down types in the 50s yeah and then they weren't at a certain point i, I feel bad for our cloaky because he was born in 21 i feel like he should have been born 20 years later because we'll talk about it soon but he eventually embraces the hippie lifestyle but he is like the creepy old dude hanging out with the hippies he's like the yeah. guy who's almost 50 yeah passing I, the reefer around if i saw him at the at this uh strumming circle i'd be like i'm going anywhere else this, yeah. cre- this creeps <laughs> i give me bad vibes but then if i found out he was a creator of gumby i'd be like you know what i want to talk to this guy let's trip and talk about pokey <laughs> let's freak out man <laughs> So Art Cloakey's life as a filmmaker began at the University of Southern California, and that's where he studied under uh, modernist filmmaker Slavko Vorkapik. And once you watch Moon Trip, you will realize this guy definitely studied under a Russian experimental <laughs> filmmaker. Wow. Because uh, Art Cloakey's first film and the first Gumby's really look like, you know, just worker and parasite style, <laughs> trippy, alienating kind of filmmaking. Discomforting, like a lot lack of music a lack of dialogue yeah it's uh so what you're saying is that the commies actually made it and it's a russian <laughs> plot it's true it's true i don't know if uh, our cloaky named any names though <laughs> so this is where cloaky made what put him on the map 
was his 1953 student film, Gumbasia, which was a riff on Fantasia. It's available on YouTube. And I will say like after like 80 years later or whatever, or 70 years later, it's not really that interesting. But in terms of being from 1953, being experimental stop motion animation, it's kind of fun. Mm. And it's worth seeing just to see like what the prototype of his version of stop motion animation would be. It's interesting to watch. I mean, I guess you also, I try to put myself into the mindset of, have I ever, if I had never seen stop motion before, this is just magic. If you wanted to like read magazines or books or whatever, you probably knew how they did it. Yeah. But um, if you're, you know, just a youngster, just sees this like, how is glue, uh, how are all these like blobby things bouncing around? That's crazy. And even at that point in time, like Art Cloakey had some highfalutin artistic interest and in, in goals because oh, man, yeah. with Gumbasia, he was like, I want this to be like a massage for your optic nerve. <laughs> just like by watching this it's going to touch parts of your eyeball that will stimulate you and make you feel better so even back then he was you know kind of far out like yes. beatnik man no it's so funny to hear even in his first films he's like i had these big visions and then it just gets you know that that vision he has gets shoved into a box of children entertainment or or also religion <laughs> it's true like i feel like seeing where he started if gumby didn't happen he could have pursued this path but i think but the tragedy of Gumby is like he was never made to make Gumby. Mm. He should have never made Gumby. It he was just the check. Exactly. You know? How do you say no to that kind of money back then? But uh, you mentioned it before, Henry, but stop motion animation did exist before Gumby, of course. Mm. It existed before filmmaking with things like zoetropes. Oh, okay. Wow. So it was pretty old at that time anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, we had things like uh, contemporary things at the time, like Ray Harryhausen and Jason uh, and the Argonauts. And of course, King Kong oh, yes, yeah. was one of the most famous stop motion creations ever. Okay. All right. Well, then, yes, I take that back. Pretty well known then what stop motion was even by like 1955. But it was not on television as a new creation ah, the tv or the idiot box is what i call it <laughs> a vast wasteland so <laughs> around the time of gumbasia art was also doing uh, advertisements for companies like coca-cola and budweiser you can see those online and he was also, while in California, the tutor of the son of Hollywood producer Sam Angle. And that gave him a direct connection to Hollywood. It's all about who you know, isn't it? It's true. Like, yeah, he's uh, tu he's tutoring some rich kid. And then that producer's like, hey, do you make stuff? I, you probably do. You live in L.A. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I like knowing that 70 years later, it's the same story. Yes. <laughs> you got to tutor the right uh, large son. So, yes. <laughs> uh, so this guy, like, asks Art, you know, what he does and, like, what he's made. And uh, apparently... He really likes this Gumbasia short, so he puts on a screening for other producers, and Art Cloakey is there. And by the end of the screening, like they're like pacing back and forth. They're so excited, and Art Cloakey <laughs> in this documentary later in life, he's just like, I thought I was going to be working in Hollywood. I thought I was going to give, give him these Hollywood opportunities. But for him, the offer was, we want you to make a clay character for children. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is when his life a really split from where he wanted to go you're right yeah is the way he tells the story in the doc it definitely feels like a turn like this giant turn in his life that he he gets told by the people who have the money you know your life isn't that you aren't this type of artist we demand you be this type of artist and i he could have said no but it's like that kind of opportunity you'll never get it again like he right or wrong he took it and it it, it, it led him to making art that did touch people but it, it's so crazy that you, you see this like weird beatnik guy with all these strange colors and they're just like kids would like this shit yeah, yeah. really underestimating what he could do and i feel like why I like these early Gumbies is they are amateurish in the literal sense of the word, it, in the literal sense of the word. It is uh, a guy trying to figure out how to do this as he's doing it, <laughs> because after Gumbasia, he makes one Gumby pilot that's also on YouTube. You can watch that. It's even more unsettling than this one, because it's all about Gumby, like, getting mutilated and deformed. At one point, he chops himself in half with a sword. It's yeah. really weird. Yeah, that is so effed up. Like, there's... Uh, they've, 
they don't like uh, in the later ones. It, Gumby doesn't get hacked up all that much. It's no. Uh, <laughs> these early ones are all about like Gumby gets split in half. Gumby gets squished. Like f- having fun with the idea of just like what can this clay character be? So yeah, our Cloakie is tasked with creating these characters in this world for and and just like after making one claymation short, mm, which had no characters or dialogue, right? Like it's so he's not. I mean, also when you talk about amateurish, you see in these first ones like this is not a storyteller per se no no No. it's not thinking about like well what's an act structure and what what (laughs) what are the goals of this character just they all seem very random Mm -hmm. which is what i like because it's just so strange yeah it's magical in a way like i mean the the amateurishness mixed with uh this guy having to reframe his artistic ideals for a show for five-year-olds is makes for some very interesting art Uh, i mean what else from like the mid 50s is that interesting you know i totally agree and so uh, art is tasked with making these clay ideas into characters for children. And so he creates Gumby. So there are many things that go into the creation of Gumby. So he's green because that's the color of life, of course, with plant life. But also that makes him racially ambiguous. Uh, his lumpy head is because originally he did not have a lumpy head. He looked too much like a penis. <laughs> so he is based on our Cloakie's grandfather who had like a big lumpy haircut. I love that old lumpy haircut. Uh, an asymmetry. That's, you know, that's good design. Mm-hmm. I like the design of Gumby. And he's named after Muddy Clay from his grandparents' farm that they called Gumbo, which Gumbo, mm-hmm. also the name is of Gumby's dad. Ah, right, right, right. Yeah. And I believe Gumba. Gumbo looks like he's made of clay, like actual like earth clay too too i no, i i mean what's lovely about gumby is he looks like something a child could make like you can't uh actually sometimes in in close-ups you can see the wires underneath them but yeah. normally you're not supposed to but like any kid could shape a green bunch of clay together to look like him and then they just squish in their fingers for the i always love like the thumb thumbprint prints yeah. yeah 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 and part of gumby's why his feet are so wide is because so the clay figure won't fall over when you're moving it around <laughs> that's why he's so I, I was wondering why he's so hunched over when he's walking <laughs> yeah. in some of the shots and it really is just like well he'd fall over for the picture if he wasn't in this short uh gumby walks like he shit his pants because <laughs> In this short, they figure out, let's just have him slide around. But in the beginning of the short, it's just like, well, here, I guess this is a walk cycle for Gumby. It looks yeah. just like he's like always like trudging. <laughs> keep it together. Yes. Keep it together. <laughs> and uh, in general, his first iteration is based on uh, the gingerbread man, which was mm. a suggestion by Ruth Cloakie, uh, our Cloakie's first wife. And that's why I also like early Gumby's. He's a little shit who yes. runs around and gets in trouble. He eventually becomes this goody goody character that I hate, but I like him just running around, st- m- stealing a spaceship going to the moon and dying Mm -hmm. or like shooting guns off when he finds pokey things like that like just being a little troublemaker yeah i like him as a you know the once he got like friends they got to be the troublemakers and he became the reactor it's it's just like what happened to mickey mouse mickey mouse is a bad boy in his first ones and then donald duck comes around and he gets to be the bad boy while mickey mouse goes oh no don't do that and that's what gumby does or like he Uh, scolds other characters for being bad now now yes yeah he's uh i i also remember there was one that like made me there was one in the 80s that made me want jelly rolls so much Mm. like it was all about making jelly rolls and uh this was a joke on community but claymation food well uh, him stop motion food looks very delicious to me there's something about it i guess especially pastries it just looks like so tasty and glossy i just want to eat all of that clay (laughs) right on screen i would fill my stomach with plasticy although play-doh is non-toxic so try it at home sure uh so yes uh based on this first pilot again it's on youtube Uh, gumby uh, he does a bunch of stuff he sings a little song about himself but he's like selling himself to the uh, (laughs) advertisers so this one pilot is fine but they say okay art make another short film and it's the one we're covering in this episode so the episode we're covering is literally the second gumby ever made and the only the first one to air yeah the 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 introduction to the world of gumby yeah and this originally aired on a place you would not expect because i wasn't even thinking about this this aired as a short subject on the howdy doody show Mm. very very popular show for boomers of the time and it made me think like oh duh this idea of a host with puppets is Pee Wee's Playhouse. That's that's what that was riffing on. Like the human host with puppets who shows you cartoons. Like I did not even connect the two until watching Howdy Doody clips. Well, because Howdy Doody was like nothing to me. Like I do think my mom grew up watching it. She would have, I think 
my mom was like four or five when the first Gumby premiered, but uh, like never, it's only in the context of like, yeah, it's Gumby. Gumby by itself. You don't think of it as a thing that aired on the Howdy Doody show. Mm-hmm. Like, and Howdy Doody was like one of the biggest things ever. And then it's, hey, it's forgotten. Like it's, everything stays around all the time now, but it used to be if something was big for 10 years, it then went away and you yes. never talked about it again. There was no extended Howdy Doody universe yes, or anything like yeah. that. But no, I was watching Howdy Doody clips and one thing i found very funny is like the entire child audience is dressed very formally like their parents are like you're going to be on tv you're little boomers you put on your suits Mm -hmm. put on your little tie and your shoes you're wearing your sunday best young man and then probably some you know uh violence was done to that kid if they did uh so yeah this airs on the howdy doody show and the kids love it so based on this gumby is greenlit for an entire season of shorts and one thing that's lost to time and was not in the documentary is that Gumby was part of something called The Gumby Show with a human host who interacted with puppets and had a child audience. Wow. Yes. Wow. Man, that's I was I was uh, curious how you're going to fill in some timeline stuff because the Gumby Dharma did jump around a lot or just not cover things that I kind of was like, wait, I... But I never heard of this the Gumby show with a puppet. That that sounds a bit like the the padding that they would put in the Beanie and Cecil show of like no 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 let's yes. just talk to the Beanie and Cecil puppet. No. There, I mean there was no Gumby puppet. It was a different puppet family altogether. But Gumby was the main attraction, the thing you were waiting to watch. I but see. until then, it was a, a dumb host wearing a derby. For some reason, all the kids in the audience are wearing derbies too. It was a derby based form of entertainment. <laughs> the host would like dance around and sing and interact with puppets. But then you would see the Gumby cartoon, and there was an entire season of something called the gumby show the live action stuff is lost of time there are some very rough clips on youtube but there was one season and that is where this first season of gumby shorts comes from from 1956 amazing man i had no clue i i thought they all just ran on like howdy doody or other shows but to know that it had its own named thing the gumby show i i was aware of this puppet stuff because in the uh, just the format because that was a big part of the bullwinkle uh history because they kept coming up with like honestly it's cost like 30 minutes of of even tv animation like that's a lot of money if you can pad it out like puppets are cheaper than a drawing and then animating something so have a they for many times are like what if just a moose like was a puppet and introduced it and eventually they got on bowling they got enough money to just have it be full animation for the whole thing there, there's like one clip of this on youtube where you can see just how disgusting children's programming was at the time <laughs> where the guy's talking to the puppies like and who did you say this show is brought to us by why it's brought to us by frosted flakes they're delicious Ooh, just like <laughs> enter, like commercials in the entertainment uh maybe you know maybe it, uh, we actually weren't as commercialized as our uh grandparents were. <laughs> they, they saved the commercials for the commercial breaks yeah but yeah gumby was part of something called the gumby show uh i in the you know it was filmed in color the gumby cartoons but i believe it was aired in black and white with this black and white show mm, okay yeah i i mean that's good future proofing too that he filmed it in color like that and could just use it for color later like i guess by the late 50s some people were accepting they're like well tv's black and white now but eventually it will be in color like it was a big deal i'm gonna talk about bullwinkle so much but it's <laughs> contemporary but um bullwinkle they made a big deal when they went to nbc like no we are broadcasting in color finally they mm. always animated in color but they couldn't count on advertising it as broadcasting color until they went to nbc like nbc's mascot is a peacock yeah. because they're like look at colors we <laughs> have them color the network with colors nbc <laughs> okay so what i didn't know about gumby before we did this episode like i knew about the 80s revival but i didn't know about gumby is that it existed in like weird fits and starts so there's a 1956 season and then it doesn't come back until 1960 where they make a huge package of syndicated episodes that also introduce characters like prickle and goo created to represent what famed east west philosopher alan watts called the two types of people the prickly and the gooey so very high-minded yeah all this the eastern mysticism as it comes into to his world i'm like that's this is well i mean it was definitely the style at the time which is also like a bit of um i don't know the magical east like there's yeah there's a few times where i'm like oh things are different now that i think it not not that you can't get into you know eastern religion or whatever but when i see him in the documentary talk about like yeah i was a white guy who just like really got into meditation or whatever like that was so the style at the time yeah if you were an artistic type who is just not happy with the uh the rat race the 
post World War II, uh, you know, boom. Like this, I feel empty. Well, let's go to another country and see what mm-hmm. they're doing. Is usually the answer. Well, because obviously you couldn't turn to like any Marxist type thing, because then you'd you'd be fully ostracized in there. So if you can't look at material conditions around you, well, then you better just look inside and go to another plane. Maybe that will fix your your problems. I uh, I think Prickle was my favorite growing I, up. I like Prickle because he's a jerk. Yeah, that, that's what's so funny. And that Pokey is like a dick. Like he's just like, man, I don't know why they do that, Gumby. A Pokey <laughs> is an adorable character. He's my favorite design, I think, in the whole in the whole series. They really uh, landed on him <laughs> early. It seems wrong to me when Gumby rides him. I'm just yeah. like, hey, no, you're equal. I don't like when they're like hanging out in the living room, but also he's a horse that <laughs> that Gumby can ride around. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, also those are the guys that uh, Cloaky voices. So I think that's where he gets out like his frustrations and stuff for sure. <laughs> so the 60s are just massive for Gumby. So between 1960 and 1968, there are 87 new shorts produced for Gumby wow. as part of a syndicated package that also includes the 50s stuff. And uh, this is when Gumby is super merchandised. So we see the shorts getting less weird. Gumby is getting more defined in terms of what he looks like. He starts getting a little tiny mouth with teeth that I hate, mm-hmm. but it makes it a more marketable, attractive character that you want to buy. I just want it to be a yellow circle that moves around. I don't want to yeah. see teeth. Yeah. I don't like the idea of Gumby with teeth. <laughs> uh, and, you know, more there's toys. And in 1961, they get another opportunity because who other than the Lutheran Church would approach Art Cloakey to make what would become Davy and Goliath. Mm-hmm. And about half of that show's 73 episodes would be produced around the same time as this Gumby run in the 60s. And then Davy and Goliath would run into the early 70s. Man, he was just pumping out the footage at that place. I mean, obviously not alone. He had a lot of employees yeah. at that point. Point, but I mean, I, I had heard it characterized on a Simpsons commentary that Cloakie like did uh, Davy and Goliath more for the money than than for Gumby. Definitely, he was not a Lutheran. <laughs> uh, I don't know how Christian he was, and apparently they wanted all creative control and to even like take his name off of like writing credits and stuff like that. Damn, this is where it gets kind of weird because uh, right. Art Cloakie, he's a Bohemian guy again. He's a hippie born twenty years too early, and uh, what happens is Art Cloakie leaves his first wife. He leaves the entire family family to go on a journey of eastern mysticism aka fucking around yeah. and doing drugs yeah as it was presented in the fi- in that documentary uh they weren't entirely forgiving and he wasn't too forgiving of himself either but yeah it still definitely felt the characterization of like back in the 60s it was seems like i gotta find myself man and nobody really wanted to talk about Aren't you just like a selfish white guy, rich white guy who just wants to like fuck around and abandon responsibility? He, he's living a he's living out a John Updike novel in his own life, uh, right? And yeah. yeah, in the documentary when he's like ninety, he's like that was the worst part of my life, where the worst part of me came out. He talks about like when he leaves his family, he hears his daughter crying, and he's just like, I regret that I never went back to comfort her. I just I walked out of the house, uh. and because of that, this is a this is big news for Gumby Research, which is not reflected in wikis or like research our cloaky he is not present for most of the 60s gumbies his wife is doing everything man that that i feel like ruth even in that documentary got done a little dirty it's like she's i i will say i was so shocked watching that doc that his son in it refers to her as ruth like he's like yeah, yeah and ruth did that. i was like i think that's, that's a son from his mom. second uh, wife i get i all right otherwise well. he'd be like much older I don't know that I feel Ruth got a bad deal in that oh. documentary too. I mean, I think she was not alive when they made it, so they couldn't talk to her. But yeah, sure. uh, Ruth, while Art Cloakey goes to like fuck around and do drugs and explore religion and whatnot, Ruth runs Gumby. Ruth runs Davy and Goliath. Ruth is making all the money for the Gumby factory. I believe sh- she's responsible for most of the '60s Gumbies, which may be why I don't think they're very good. <laughs> and also, uh, Art Cloakey, this Bohemian guy, he's trapped in making this like mass market religious entertainment and children's entertainment you feel like he was just so stifled and he needed to get out oh sure i i don't blame him for that but and at least he admitted to it in that doc but it's like there's 
better ways to do it that are more fair to especially your child like yeah you you don't have to stay married to someone you don't want but just that he i mean i i think in a rather sexist way he was able to count on like well i'm the husband if i just like walk out she's just got to keep it going and i'll just leave it to her and she she can collect the checks and i'll probably get i mean when he's living that bohemian lifestyle too like that's off of the riches he's making off definitely Gumby and and Davey and goliath yeah i knew there was a divorce i knew uh things were not good between them but i didn't know he just left uh man and him in all those pictures with the counterculture folks too i was like but i also love that he's like still this like skinny guy white guy in his 40s like he won't even we're used to now of like if you go bald you shave it all off yeah because that looks more fashionable he in these pictures he's like if he's not wearing his hat he just has like long drapes of hair on his side i'm like dude shave that off this looks bad he's really weird looking in those old pictures with the hippies Uh, yeah i and you're right he is one of those guys like the old man's here is trying to like fuck the 20 year olds like it's and but his childhood was so awful that i yeah. understand why he's like now it's finally time to sow my wild oats. and also like what do dads do they leave yes, what do you yeah. do with your family you just you walk out and or you give them up to people mm-hmm. so yeah not yeah. not the best role models he had growing yeah. up yeah not that that forgives it no no yeah so if you look at some of his other work you can see why he was creatively stifled by gumby because there's some stuff he made around the origins of gumby that were was him experimenting with how would humans work in stop motion? There's a few mm. things he made, which would eventually end up in Gumby shorts. So one of them is called Yard Party, and that would air in the 60s. So Yard Party is a black and white stop motion short he made with human subjects. And in the 60s series, it aired with Gumby and Pokey like introducing it. Like, oh, what's this funny <laughs> thing on TV? Uh, that covers that covers the time. Like, that gets you another episode yeah. in the can. <laughs> and another one uh, with this guy called like the Plucky Plumber would eventually be held over to the late 80s they would work it into a short called the funny bathtub so you could see like our cloaky as Gumby is taking off, he was thinking, like, what can stop motion animation do? But people only wanted Gumby. Uh, man, he's he's trying to invest himself with, into some release of his artistic desires. And everybody just wants him to be in charge of the, the Gumby factory. You know, that that's a big difference to him and Henson. Like, Henson, uh, he still worked on the things he wanted to work on sometimes. But he also recognized, like, if everybody wants Kermit, I'll just put on this Kermit yeah. all the time. Like, and what also, leaving his wife was... He got away with it more professionally he's like hey i just gotta work in london you know it's how oh darn i gotta move away and work in london yeah he didn't just fuck off he was ostensibly working on other things yeah. right yeah while also having sex i mean very true cheating very on true constantly. that rewatching old muppet shows is me trying to guess which of the female guests had sex with Jim Henson? Okay. Like it's it's a little game I play. Well, I will say in the Linda Ronstadt one, she is so close to Kermit oh, in yeah. it, so many scenes. I I I have a feeling when the uh, when the Muppet hand goes between the female guest's breasts, you're like, what's going on? Yes, yeah, I, and especially she the way she talks about Kermit, of like, oh Kermit, you're so smart and you're so blank. And like, there's also in that same episode kermit in a song that you would not think kermit would sing is a song about infidelity oh and like my he, God. he sings this old like uh public domain song like well you knew i was a liar when i married when you married me so it's your problem like, take a hit jane uh yes i know i know but but that's that's a different genius we're talking about so eventually the gumby well dries up gumby i think uh that syndicated package ends in 68 that's when they stop production and then davy and goliath runs until 73 and this is when Art Cloakey meets his second wife, Gloria, who would later become Gloria Cloakey. And they met at what the documentary wants to call a nudist camp, but apparently it is only kind of a nudist camp. <laughs> but you can tell the kind of woman he was looking for and the kind of life he was living by. It was like this like therapy group that was clothing optional. So you can see yeah. like what was going on in the funky 70s. I have to think he went to a lot of like uh, things he'd call a spiritual retreat that were really like orgies. Yes. Like just... <laughs> We're going to get in touch with nature, man. Uh, Yeah. And each other. But what they don't say is each other's genitals also. No, I, I, that picture when he says like, no, no, it was clothing optional. And just this picture of him like nude from the waist up. We don't see anything. I just like, oh, this is probably like a full nude shot of him just hanging out. Uh, And they were able to stay afloat. They created a toy called Moody Rudy uh, that brought in some money. But uh, what a wacky toy that was. It's like a weird Clark Gable face that you can kind of squish and make faces with. That's another weird moment 
moment in the doc where he's just like, I wanted to, you know, uh, see some hip dame and, and have the character wink to her. And then when they, and they then act that out in a short and, uh, you get to see his taste in ladies too. Like this, yeah. this, uh, alternative looking girl with black lipstick and neckerchief on like, yeah, that's, He'd that's his taste. Hitting on her in a coffee house. Oh yeah. It's like, Hey, you want one of these jazz cigarettes? You know, I actually got to hang out with Mingus. So a lot of things are happening in the 70s. What's not happening for them is money. Uh. So Moody Rudy bringing in some money, but Gumby money is drying up. They're having to sell a lot of things. They make a few weird ass shorts, including one called Mandala, which is influenced by, uh, you know, him learning a lot of things from like Indian gurus and things like that. Also, his daughter takes her own life during the creation of this short. Holy crap. And if you look at Mandala, you say, well, this is not very entertaining, but this is what you should have been making all along. Like, Mm. this is what you want to do. It's trippy. It's weird. It's unsettling. It's beautiful. It's not a mass market goody goody character that gets into scrapes and and this outlet for grief and yeah. just like expression yeah it's i that was another of those moments in the doc where i was like what like i yeah because when he said how there's something that if you watch not enough documentaries you can start to figure something out of like well they haven't interviewed his daughter yet and he was saying he was sad about her in the past so i was trying to imagine what happened and then when they said like oh a friend of hers got struck by lightning on a on a nature hike and that just mentally broke her and she never recovered i was like holy shit and and the whole time uh throughout this documentary gumpy and pokey are commenting on this and i was just like ah this is cute but i don't want to be like uh, I don't want to hear Gumby say, Art didn't care for the suicide. He took it pretty bad. I know. Like, I don't need to hear Gumby and, and Pokey say these things. Like, they they can comment on other <laughs> funny things. Like, they're on the set and they're like, oh, you know, Art, I, I love Art. The, both meanings. Like, that's funny. Them saying, like, the divorce was really hard for it. Like, yeah. that. I was like, I don't need to hear that. I don't want these characters to be aware of suicide and divorce. But I did yes. like Pokey saying it's like, and that's when he started working with the Lutheran boy. Oh. Oh, and yes, that's like yeah. a little slam on Dave and Goliath, which sucks. And it's definitely, it is seen as lesser by them. They're like, no, they, well, the documentary wanted to treat Gumby as, uh, as very important and Dave and Goliath as like shit. And that I love those clips they even show of when they just use Davey's puppet in a car, in yeah. a special. And they're like, well, he's not called Davey, but it's Davey shows up and he's a dick. He really is a dick in that clip. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the seventies, not great for them. Personal tragedy. I mean, he finds new love but there's personal tragedy not a lot of financial success it seems like he's just going to be the weird old guy who lives in california it's like that's the gumby house (laughs) there's a weird old guy in there but on march 27th 1982 something happens that makes gumby awareness bigger than ever where is he he's late again right he's late again right where is he damn it he's gonna be here just a few minutes he'll be here why am i here why am I here? Why am I here working with this no-talent, drunken hypochondriac horse? That nag could not get a job on a merry-go-round. And yes, uh, a young Edward Murphy playing Gumby on SNL is truly what made people care about Gumby again. And yes, this is the tradition of you're in your early 20s. The joke is that thing you grew up with. What if it was fucked up? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, it's good to know that that was uh, not just our generation that did it, but every generation. For us, did this it. was Harvey Birdman. This yeah. was Adult Swim. Yeah. Everything on Adult Swim. This is the same deal. Like, what if the Gumby you grew up with, who's so sweet and nice, what if he swore like that? And he was very <laughs> Jewish. And I mean, so was yeah, Pokey. That's true. <laughs> it's very. I mean, it's also very. It's easy comedy. It. Uh, it's memorable a lot because. Eddie Murphy is such a funny mm-hmm. performer, but it's easy comedy. I I was just reminded recently, unfortunately, of the many terrible Pete Holmes does uh, video game stuff. Oh. Pete Holmes interviews Chun Li. Pete Holmes interviews Dulcet. I don't care for this. Yeah, I, but it was the same. Or Robot Chicken is a, is oh, a yeah. better example. And they would it. even do Gumby stuff in Robot Chicken. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so much of Robot Chicken is that same spirit. And here you've got, you know, a very early 20s uh, aged 
Eddie Murphy, he grew up on on all the Gumbies, so it's easy for him to just goof on it, and he's and just his like voice that sounds nothing like Gumby. Yeah, it also speaks to this idea of like, oh, the people you see on TV are nothing like they see on. I guess by nineteen by eighty two, you've got all these tell alls coming out, and everybody mm-hmm. knows the the dirt in Hollywood. Yeah, old Hollywood was a bad place to be. Yeah. So yeah, I think just based on this, people care about Gumby. The I'm Gumby, damn it, you know, it's a meme in the. <laughs> early 80s whatever a meme was back then so i want to say based on this new popularity this is what uh causes art and gloria cloakey they take gumby shorts on this 10 city tour like this is the test do people care about gumby and all these college kids who grew up with gumby are there and they're probably stoned but they fucking love gumby that's a really interesting part of the documentary too because they do not mention snl at all all yes but it you're absolutely right that's what caused them to like be reminded of gumby and take it on the road it was also amazing to see the documentary was made in the bay area so there's bay area specifics mm. like the landmark theater that is like in my neighborhood yeah that's right they, they interview the guy who like did showings of it like that gumby uh, showing was done like four blocks from my house we're living so, in history here yeah then the 80s happens and then let's fast forward to the late 80s so of course henry and i are a little children and because of renewed interest in gumby cloaky forms a new studio and they make 99 new shorts that are part of a package that are also including existing shorts as well so it's a gigantic gumby package that hits in 1988 and i was there and i watched it and i loved it I bought new Gumby toys. I watched every episode. And part of the fun was the incredible shift in style of like when you'd watch an 80s produced one and then one like this would show up you'd be like well, i feel weird like, yeah what the hell I, I, I where's my mom i'm scared yeah uh so yeah like the only downside of this package is that uh because they couldn't get the rights to the original licensed music that they use so like the music in old gumby is like ren and stimpy it's like just this classic library music that they borrowed and, and paid right. for but because they couldn't get the rights for the syndicated package they redid all the music and the voices it's the same people but it's new recordings but if you go onto amazon and watch these they are the original versions okay that's good yeah well i probably as a little kid it would have been distracting to me if gumby and uh voice changed or pokey or whoever but uh i like hearing the weird voices in this first one especially yeah (laughs) and uh, in the 80s they try to make gumby cool and that's a mistake because they try to make him late 80s cool and that he has a band they make uh, it more of a late right. 80s show and that he has a sister now called Minga, which I feel sounds like a dirty word to me. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's just a ton of Gumby stuff. The parents grew up with Gumby, are presumably watching it with their kids like my mom was. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, like there couldn't be a better time for our Cloakie. And this is a time of his life. Like our Cloakie is almost like 70 making this new Gumby. <laughs> He's an old man. Incredible. He's so... So, old, but I mean, I guess he kind of took a decade off. So he's like, I, I like making stuff again. I mean, talk about another dark moment in that doc when he's like, man, those six years of producing Gumby, pretty great. Uh, I, I loved it. Too bad time never lasts. Yeah. And you get old. I was like, oh, Jesus. there are, There are some sad old man quotes like aging is a cruel trick played on you by God. Oh, and talking about like the death of his second wife. Yeah. Too, the, but uh, it was funny seeing the photos from the 80s because I also got to see like, uh, Gloria, who took a big interest in the production of it, too, like you see her as a hippie in these 70s photos and then in the 80s she's like wearing a business suit yeah. with her big shoulder pads i will uh, say like these are the weakest shorts uh and they're so bad they're good in a way because as of this recording riff tracks is about to release their version of the movie and we'll talk about that in a second oh so they're at this point in history when you're listening to this it'll be already out but at this recording it's not out yet but i feel like art cloaky is like almost 70 he should not have been writing 100 new gumby shorts <laughs> No. He found new talent to animate these things, and a lot of that new talent went on to go make like Nightmare Before Christmas and things like that, and go to Pixar. But yeah, we, we talked about how Henry Selleck on the D- Nightmare Before Christmas, like he got his he one of his first jobs was on Gumby, and that to be able to even make a Nightmare Before Christmas in San Francisco, he was like, we can do it in San Francisco because. 
all of the stop motion experts I know worked here because they worked on all of the cloaky stuff. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the 80s Gumbies have the best animation, Yeah, but yeah. they're also written by a man who's your grandfather's age in the late <laughs> 80s who thinks, what do kids think is cool? Oh yeah, rock music. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, they're not very good. So all of this culminates in Gumby the movie, which apparently was completed in 1992, but couldn't find a distributor until 1995. It had a very tiny theatrical release that made five whole figures jesus man well i mean i know by the 90s kids were not into gumby anymore but i can't believe they couldn't find a distributor for that long to even just give it a chance you and know? you know what the movie sucks it's yeah, bad okay. like it's written again written by a man in his 70s <laughs> for kids and it's it's a rotten movie and yeah. uh again he should have trusted younger people to put these things together mm-hmm. uh, i mean he relied on them a lot for the animation but it feels like creatively he just wanted to do all the gumby stuff it does also to compare him to jim henson it seemed like jim henson could delegate a mm-hmm. bit more and, and trust his uh younger folks to do stuff like frank oz eventually got to direct things and other people got to be writers or executive producers but yeah it sounds like cloaky was too uh in control he didn't want to give it up and that's basically where gumby ends because <laughs> there's that revival series uh the movie can't find a distributor and then the movie comes out in 95 and then it just bam the door slams shut on gumby is that period no more gumby I, those reruns on nickelodeon must not have done like great numbers either because they, if they had like they i mean it looks even a thing trying to be hip in the 80s by 1996 that 80s stuff looks incredibly yeah. like uh tired and boring too yeah so weirdly enough davy and goliath did have a revival in 2004 made by the cloakies it's the it's the snowboard christmas special yeah which we, i think we talked about we, on something on the on the simpsons where they did the davy mm. and goliath parody yeah that's incredible and again gum i think the most recent gumby animation you can see is in that documentary which right. it's not technically technically a real Gumby short but it is Gumby and Pokey voiced by the same people who are now dead and it's original animation so I think technically the last Gumby animation since 1995 outside of commercials and like parodies and stuff is that Gumby Dharma documentary well because like yeah I was trying to remember like didn't I see Gumby in commercials when I was looking up Gumby commercials I did spot him like it's happy Honda days yeah and Honda's really great <laughs> that's where he belongs <laughs> uh, as a pitch man <laughs> but it also feels wrong to see I know why they do it but it also seem, feels wrong to see Gumby animated through CG you mm-hmm. know I want him to always be stop motion. Also, with all the money going around, like, couldn't Leica buy the Gumby rights and finally do Gumby rights? Mm. I mean, the well, now, like, even the cloaky son is dead, so maybe they can buy, somebody will buy the rights off of whoever else has it. I, I think it just gone forgotten because there, there was never another revival, like, 20 years after the right. 80s. Like, in the late aughts, there was no new Gumby for kids to watch. Uh, I mean, by that point, you know, uh, it, the, the mentality was gone of you recycling and recycling stuff, you know, that's why like the looney tunes we're the last generation to get gumby Mm -hmm. bullwinkle the looney tunes after us the it was like well no we make new cartoons every year those run for five years and then we make new cartoons of a different series and you're right i think the reason gumby has gone underused is because uh it's still owned by the cloakies it's owned by Prima vision their company like uh viacom doesn't own it warner brothers doesn't own it they can't just be like ah fucking put gumby in something i don't care <laughs> you have to go to the cloakies they have to sell it to you and they've only made things on their own mm-hmm. yeah they, they can't have josh gad just be gumby <laughs> like jo- maybe josh gad has an amazing idea for Gumby and they won't give it to Mm, him. Let's ask Seth Rogen. So on the official Gumby website, which exists... (laughs) I love that we get to see the web mistress of Gumby in the documentary too. The web mistress. Uh, On the official history, it ends in 2015, mysteriously, but it does say they are working with Jim Henson Productions to make a new series. I have to assume that fell through. I have to think so too. Uh, Man, I'd love to see them work together on stuff because they like... The Henson did sell out, but he didn't sell at everything like the jim henson studio still exists and makes new things mm-hmm. like they just did that earth to ned show which was not owned by disney it was made for disney but uh yeah i would have liked to have seen that but i would guess you know 
Well, especially once Ark died, it's like just seemed to be like, well, who even drives it now? Like his son does. And then his son died like just a couple oh, of years really? ago. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Well, I looked at it like he died at 56. It's very sad. Wow. Like, yeah. I, I I mean, there's 8 million tragedies in his story. <laughs> yeah. It's a big, but but he lived to 88. Like him dancing at the end of that doc. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's so sweet. And like Gumby and Pokey are dancing next to him. Yeah, please yeah. watch Gumby Dharma if you want to know more about him. But yeah, what an interesting guy. And it's just like, I, I don't mean to say, I, want, I don't want to say this to be cruel, but I feel like he was never made to make Gumby. <laughs> he just it was thrown into this role and did the best that he could, but I feel like he was always in over his head with this production. And the best stuff to come out of this was with him figuring it out. I love mm-hmm. this early stuff so much because it's this guy still allowed to be weird before he's hammered into place by like marketability and capitalism. Yeah, before every executive like says, all right, enough of this shit. We need like, we got to sell these toys. Like, make this, him friends. Make him friends. We need other toys to sell. He can't just like goof around like all these demands yeah and then then just to think of it as like it's just dead like nobody mm-hmm. cares i mean i guess you know on youtube it gets like it's uh, got a few million views like, people watch it i mean we on those rocky and bullwinkles they had like a couple tens of thousands of views right uh, yeah, yeah this one had this gumby moon trip the official post of it has 1.5 million views which is you know not a bad number no but no though i was i was also thinking of how gumby doesn't really exist anymore after watching eddie murphy's return to snl at the end of 20 19 where of course he's going to do all the throwback characters he does buckwheat he does uh every character he's doing that includes gumby and when he did gumby it hit me of like him parodying himself 37 years ago on gumby is older than gumby huh. was when he first made fun of it that's true that's like, true that's I, how it's it's mega nostalgia for his mockery of a thing he was nostalgic for that's how old this shit is yeah and when the gumby revival was happening in 1988 that was only 20 years after it went off the air so it's just like what was 20 years ago oh 2001 one yes yeah, yeah. It's scary time math here no i mean i uh, basically we're just saying like i don't want to get old like cloaky either that <laughs> old sucks. age is a cruel trick yeah, jesus <laughs> <laughs> i guess on that note yes uh <laughs> thanks for listening to this history of art cloaky and gumby and we'll come back very soon to talk about the trippy adventure of moon trip Hello, everybody, and welcome to the break for a What a Cartoon episode all about Gumby. I am one of your hosts, Bob Mackey, on the run from the vile, murderous blockheads, and who is here with me today, as always. Hey, it's Andrew Gilbert, skating along on my feet into a good book. That's the low-budget way to do it. And this episode is brought to you, by the way, by James Eldred, one of our top-tier patrons. Mm-hmm. He selected this. He's supporting our show. If you want to be cool like James and support our show, please head on over to patreon.com slash talking Simpson. Sign up for five bucks a month, and when you do, you'll get all these episodes one week at a time and at free and also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes all of the $5 paywall podcasts we've made for over four years of the Patreon. They'll be made available to you immediately as soon as you sign up. That includes all of our limited miniseries, including Talking Futurama, Talking Critic, Talking Mission Hill, and most recently we covered the first half of King of the Hill's second season with our Talking of the Hill podcast, and there will be another miniseries coming up in the fall of 2021 for $5 and higher patrons. That's all happening at patreon.com slash talking simpsons, and there is also a $10 level when you sign up for that you get all the five dollar stuff plus access to one mega long podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher and what is that henry bob is referring to the what a cartoon movie podcast so if you're a free feed listener you've probably heard our many extended previews for each month's what a cartoon movie but you can only hear the full thing if you are a ten dollar and up subscriber at patreon.com slash talking simpsons you get all that five dollar stuff bob mentioned but you also get often over four hours of me and bob talking about an animated feature film super in depth going into the history and then dissecting it scene by scene like we do with these classic cartoons right now we're in the middle of our disney renaissance summer first we covered hercules the 1997 classic and also this month hunchback of notre dame and next month it'll be another disney renaissance classic and there is a ton in our back catalog you're gonna want to check out covering things as diverse as tiny tunes beavis and butthead spider-man akira kiki's delivery service and so so much more almost three years worth of what a cartoon movies are at your disposal in addition to all the five dollar things if you go up to that premium ten dollar level at 
Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And if you've never signed up for Patreon before, it's so easy to do. And once you sign up, you're given access to a code. You just drop that code into whatever you use to listen to podcasts. And that way you can download all of our bonus podcasts alongside all the podcasts you already listen to as part of your podcasting lifestyle. And Patreon also has an app for any smart device. And you can download our bonus episodes that way as well. No matter how you do it, it is so easy to access all the content waiting for you at Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Thank you so much for sitting through this break. We'll let you get to the carefree adventures of a dad finding his son's corpse on the moon with Gumby. <laughs> it's the adventures of Gumby. Is that Gumby? Yeah! Get up! Look at that! It's Gumby and his world of new adventures. Go off-road with Gumby on wheels. Or burn rubber with Gumby Racer. Or take on the Blackheads with Gumby Ninja. Each playset comes with Gumby computer coloring disc you create with. Gumby and the Gumby playsets from Trendmasters. Gumby, Gumby, he's here and he will be sure to stay. So we're back to talk about Moon Trip, the technically second Gumby thing ever made, but the only first one to air. And just imagine, uh, it's, I believe, May of 1956. The dates are fuzzy. You are a young boomer. Your <laughs> World War II veteran father is drunk in a chair. Your mother presumably <laughs> baking. And then this comes on TV. Whoa. Your mind is blown, right? Yeah. Your yeah. mind is blown. You've never seen anything like this in your life. Uh, watching the clay just roll around to make letters, like that that, that right there is already Cloakie showing off his his artistic side because it's you know in modernism it's showing the artifice of it he's showing you here's the balls of clay that will turn into a thing Mm -hmm. like that and it shows you like here the way gumby rolls around he wants to remind you of what he is like that uh, i guess even these like maybe postmodernist a little bit like yes i'm a ball of clay that's me and again as i said earlier in this podcast when you watch this short you will walk away saying yes this guy did study under an experimental russian filmmaker because it's (laughs) freaky and weird and abstract and unsettling and oddly literal at times it's also funny to think that like later he take lsd when this is like hey what are you on man i (laughs) in that doc he said he only took acid once i don't think so man i don't Uh, think so the way he talks of like you seem a little fried to this day yeah or or honestly he probably was just like a two tokes a day dude even in 88 i would bet (laughs) he's very chill uh Uh, so yeah we open with uh the text moon trip part one where's part two i think it aired as two parts on the howdy doody show and they just crammed it together because no gumby short is 15 minutes long they're all like five minutes long there are also some a couple weird transitions in this that i told myself like okay that has to be where a part ended but i mean i also like that uh you know as far as history preservation they didn't animate a new opening that's just like moon trip to get rid of the part one they're like no 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 just let's keep in the part one and i also love you know there's we're so used to the cleanness of computer computers i love seeing like just the gunk that's on the screen on the title screen you can see like oh here's where he like puts shit on it yeah, yeah. like gumby leaves behind like stains yes I love <laughs> he's that. pretty disgusting this gumby <laughs> character uh this filthy piece of green <laughs> plasticine yeah so yeah i really recommend you watch this on youtube uh, like while we talk about it even because it's mostly si- it's not silent but there's no real dialogue and you got to see what we're talking about so just just you know dial it up on your phone or whatever while we talk about it but also it's 1956 what else is happening in the world the space race kicked off the previous year when russia uh, announces they're going to put a satellite in the space so uh next year in 57 is when sputnik goes up right and so like the previous year that is when the space race uh really kicks off and that is when we are fascinated by uh you know space travel and everything and not until the late 60s would we actually get to the moon so yeah we are really focused on space and astronauts and spaceships and whatnot which is why gumby goes to the moon in this first cartoon yeah, you know, this would be the same year, uh, no, a year after Disneyland opened in 55, and that's all Tomorrowland is, of like, what if we were to go into space? Like, that, uh, it's something to think about with, you know, what happened to sci-fi and speculative fiction 
once you once the world got to see this is what it actually looks like to land on the moon here's mm. here's what happens and this is back when you could just dream of like well what is the moon even what would it really be like it's fun to jump around on it and yeah. there's triangle creatures that will try to kill you <laughs> i also like that uh even from the first one i wasn't sure that it, even from the first one that they keep the concept of gumby is a toy sized thing that lives in a world with toys and probably that makes it easy to film as well because in some cases he doesn't need to build props he's just no. like well, that's a here's a toy plane right it, there. it does feel like a, a like a budget solution and also like it's, like in terms of animation i don't need to buy a set here is a like a broad table with a one color backdrop and gumby can just walk across it because he's in a toy shop right yeah why if we're gonna film a table anyway why even bother putting a thing on top of it sometimes it's just it, it, yes gumby is sliding around on a table I, I just love how weird and abstract this early short is and uh so gumby the first thing he does and again they eventually figure out like let's not make gumby walk anymore so like he does this like pants shitting trudge out to this oh. large telescope and that's when he gets the idea to uh, go on the moon like he stretches up he looks in the he looks at the camera then he looks in the eyepiece and then he sees the moon and so many things unintentionally creepy like the creepy grinning face on the moon oh my god yeah that, and later uh. that asteroid is terrifying and then also there's like planets that are just like baby doll heads and what's i mean what also makes them extra disturbing is that I don't think Cloaky, well, maybe he did, but I don't think the Cloaky's intention was to unsettle, to be unsettling. It was just like, well, no, no it's a face on the moon, but that makes it even creepier that it's like uh, this, this smiling face, like come to the moon, Gumby. It's like, like the Majora's Mask moon. Yes. It's going to crush Oh my Gumby. God, you're right. And <laughs> while this whimsical, fun toy store scene is happening, this is what the soundtrack oh, is God. in the background. That's on a loop for like three minutes and i feel like well the second short it's like we have music now don't worry yes. but like it was him thinking like well what do you put in the background all right here's some cool like just a, a sound texture to exist in this scene but it's just so creepy oh it's uh, i don't know how kids get out of bed hearing that stuff like yeah it, i've had it deeply unsettling here but i guess too it, it i suppose it gives the sense of like the exploring a strange world in space i guess it's kind of a like you know it, it makes you think of space i suppose uh i also seeing gumby stretch around and do stuff like how he stretches up all the way i just think like four years after that mr fantastic is created mm. in marvel comics coincidence I, I wonder i i'm saying jack kirby ripped off art cloaky that's what i'm no i'm not i love jack kirby he's one of the most important creators in american history but so gumby has an idea again all communicated without dialogue so he's not even thinking about like writing a script with dialogue so gumby <laughs> looks through a telescope he sees the moon then he starts looking around at different things that can get him to the moon including like a passenger plane there's a helicopter there's like a traditional rocket and then there's this big orange globe thingy that he will eventually use to go to the moon so it's like a bunch of orange like spheres connected with iron rods that thing is so weird it is like that and that's what I really love about it, that it's uh, I, it works as a really good misdirect, that he sees what is, even I think in 56, people would think, rocket. And then he chooses not that, but this odd, like, you know, almost, it's like a, a, mo a, a baby mobile, mobile you'd have over the bed. Like, it just like floats around and it moves so weird. Yeah. Also, yeah, I think a person who knew what script writing was would have had lines where Gumby says, I'd love to go to the moon, but how? Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait. Instead, it's just silent, like looks at the moon and then just quietly <laughs> turns to look at all the things. And when, when he looks at the things, like uh, this fuzz guitar note plays when he looks at every different thing. I have, I have the clip of that. It's so weird. Yeah, so <sighs> it's weird. It's really yeah. weird. It's so atypical. You would not expect this to be in a cartoon. This kind, this kind of sound design. Yeah, as a way to express, like I, like oh, his thoughts are being expressed just through the music and the reaction shot. Like it's, it's so strange. Also, in the the close ups 
uh, I really like now the, the the technique of like, well, how does Gumby like move his eyelids, or if it, it and it just is you peel down the white, so it's kind of like one corner is turned over or whatever. It's it's a really in HD especially you can just see like the crinkles of the whites of his eyes. And this is when Gumby enters the spaceship. Uh, it looks much bigger than you know you would think based on the scale of all these things. But he climbs up this ladder. He go walks in. He goes, "Oh boy!" So <laughs> the first dialogue in this uh, cartoon. And then he gets in and starts fiddling with all of the uh, all of, like the buttons and knobs and stuff. It's it's kind of aimless, but he's just like, "Well, how does this work?" And quickly he figures it out. Uh, G- Cloaky with this and the gumbometer. He really likes labels on machines or yeah. dials. Label to dial. <laughs> but yeah, Gumby uh, activates the rockets, and I love the, the the crude effect. It feels like someone is literally like scratching on the film. I think it must be just yeah. scratches on film, like because what other equipment does he have? You know, like he can't like paint on the film or photograph. I think it's I think it really is just scratches on the film. Also, speaking of more like wow, this is how Gumby walks thing. Him going up the ladder looks like <laughs> yeah. crap. I, I <laughs> they just kind of like just shove him up the ladder. He like kind of teleports up. What I love about these early Gumbies is there's a line that they draw and they don't do this in the future, but Art Cloakie clearly like, all right, if we can do something in live action, we won't do it in stop motion. So a lot of the ship moving is just like, here's a string. I'm pulling the ship up on the string. It's not one frame at a time. It's like you just filming a shot of me pulling it up on a string. I really like that. It, uh, it makes it also more disturbing and real because it's just the filming techniques just change every now and then there's later they have like you know the camera will pan around to show like multiple rock guys being revealed and it's like the rock guy walks out and then the he stops moving and then the camera just has a natural live mm-hmm. action camera movement and it stops again and then a character walks out that mix of it I guess too that makes it like disturbing like nothing yeah. stays the same even like artistically the reality is like shifting where there's things are moving in one way but suddenly things are moving in a way you're familiar with I, I also now think it's less of a coincidence that the first Wallace and Gromit cartoon is about going to the moon. I was thinking of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the ship lifts off. Gumby somehow knows how to fly this ship. And then his parents waddle into the frame uh, in front of this, like, tinker toy kind of, uh, you know, construction. I can see why an executive note was give him friends because otherwise it's just like two parents going every episode. And his mom barely. So I think she goes, oh, later in this cartoon. Yeah. Well, what what else is a woman expected to do in the 50s, Bob, other than like keep her house clean? I love the mom's like crazy shoulder pad and bullet bra top. Oh, yes. Yeah. The uh, to, to quote Crow T. Robot, she is stacked. <laughs> Uh. And, and uh yeah like so his parents waddle into the frame and there is like a grotesque close-up of gumby looking worried in in the ship as just realistic sweat forms oh. on his head man that is a gif online now i've seen it's it, it's disgusting i love how it turns that's another of those ones where like oh it stopped being stop motion and you're just watching a picture of gumby that they put like droplets of water on and it rolled down it like what his face is so weird looking yeah it's yeah. too close up on his face again he's learning our cloak he's learning how to do this and again more live action shots of the, of the ship zooming around and now, now on a seven inch tv screen that close up doesn't seem as harsh you know? no no and like the tv screen you're watching it on in 56 is just like a like a fish bowl basically yes, it's yeah. like it's, you can barely tell what anything is even uncle milty looks like gumby at some point <laughs> but yeah this live action ship dive bombs the parents and and again they're more having more fun with like these are clay characters so they squish down into like mm-hmm. little blobs and go back up when the ship leaves at first i thought like boy you kid you parents need to watch your kids better but that's i'm looking at it with you know 2020 vision in the 50s kids ran wild and free Mm -hmm. like the old saying goes yeah (laughs) let your kids run wild and free (laughs) and then like uh dad takes off dad this is this is awkward like hunched over shuffle to the sports car oh that's yeah the like and now it's just because that's probably the only way he could stay stood up in a photograph he was going off balance and i feel like it's our cloaky thinking like what do kids want to see and it's like oh kids want to see like a car driving around so a lot of this is just like the dad driving past the camera then driving to what presumably <laughs> is the fire station i take it i would get yeah 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 <laughs> the sounds of all the scientific instruments in even just the rocket ship it just like drilled into my brain I was oh like, yeah i have
have those sound effects. Like I have a, a clip of every soundscape. So let's hear the inside the ship sound effects. like we're hearing experimental oh. prog rock in 1956 <laughs> you're right yeah he was ahead of his time that cloaky man i mean this is also just these soundscapes take me back to so many 50s sci-fi things we watched on mystery science theater mm-hmm. or similar shows yeah so yeah gumby's dad gumbo he drives to the fire station he gets almost uh you know plowed into again by his son's spaceship so gumby <laughs> recklessly driving this and i love uh just the inventions they have for making this ship look like like it's going to space so there's a shot uh looking up at the ship as it goes off into the distance upwards and then there's a shot uh craning up from gumbo squished on the ground so two different effects to make it seem like there's movement happening in this small space yeah it's really you know uh he only has so much real estate to film any of this like for his like studio so you got to do tricks like that to give any sense of scale for the idea of a rocket flying to the moon. And I love the very mystery science theater special effects of how do we symbolize Gumby's leaving the earth? Well, pull back from a globe. I love and that's, that. that's all there is to it. Uh, just like you'd see on your school desk, this giant globe he pulls away from. But it's so just weird and abstract. I feel like in the future, if Gumby went to space and he does, if they're leaving earth, they would just make a little earth and oh, pull away sure. from it. They wouldn't just find a globe and pull away from it. I love how crude and also like whimsical this yeah. early stuff is well that even the earth he flies away from is a toy like that's that's interesting too i i like that a lot it's interesting too that he has to like find a uh rocket ship in this one to fly to the moon like every book one after this he'd just go in a book it'd be like oh the moon book i slide into that and have an yeah. adventure there yeah. the book stuff is even in the 50s ones but the books i never really cared about the books <laughs> like he lives in the farm book yeah right i guess shouldn't he just be outside the book all the time and he just lives in whatever book he feels like moving him from a library to a, a to- I'm sorry from a toy store to a library not a great move uh, in I mean, my opinion yeah, yeah but, and libraries are boring you know they are. they're an important resource but they're not exciting for uh, a story to take place in it so gumby's in the ship he's uh, messing around with the view screen we see a uh, danger asteroid and then we see this terrifying asteroid oh. with a face on it and fangs and again it's a live action zoom on this disgusting face floating in space <laughs> and uh, that's when the danger signal goes off and gumby narrowly avoids colliding with it again a lot of more grotesque close-ups of gumby and then he's like running around the ship pulling levers and trying to figure out how to dodge the asteroid and then a live action shot of it just grazing the side of the asteroid yeah that actually feels slightly exciting there when he dodges it and also like i uh, more of the low finest i enjoy is when the static is on the view screen like it looks like cloaky or ruth or somebody just like with a crayon in their fist like when like like jagged lines on on white paper yeah all of like the signage in the ship is clearly just drawn and written there's no like uh you know typeface or anything like that oh, someone no. just sat yeah. down with a pen and did it yes yeah <laughs> and then there were all of these shots of gumby uh you know she's slowing the ship down over the moon and we're seeing so many shots of like here's what the moon looks like from above here's what it looks like from above closer up and i think it was just like yeah the moon is fascinating kids would love to see the moon so it's just a lot of moon shots and landscapes look at all these jagged peaks on the moon look at the well i, I mean to me most of the moon peaks look like nose goblins from Stimpy. Yes, <laughs> they do uh it, it's very weird but yeah uh gumby ship in another live action shot it lands amongst these the famous moon spires that we all see when we look up at the sky oh yes yeah <laughs> and uh the ship slowly lands and gumby gets out he's happy again i think this is when he says oh boy again right that's when he's yeah i wrote down like at 428 gumby says oh boy the third and fourth word said in this cartoon <laughs> and there's some fun uh because we do some things about the moon in terms of like gravity and that gumby slides down the ladder he bounces out of the ship and then he like rubs his butt in a very funny way <laughs> after he bounces a few times on his ass they show the sign that explains everything very long like it can be read in the master shot of it but then they 
have to scan over it very slowly. And for some reason, that sign, when they scan over it the second time, it's less legible. It's just oh, like the yeah. shot is not very clear the second time where it's like, <laughs> could kids read this? Uh, let's pan across it again. And then it's kind of like kind of shakily moving across the sign. <laughs> uh, you're right. It's the that uh, gets in the way of the clarity they were looking for there. But I, I love the dream logic of this. It's again, it's super whimsical and weird in that Gumby can just fly to the moon. Also, there's like tourist information on the moon where right. there's just weights waiting for you there because hey put these weights on otherwise you'll bounce around these are provided for you moon visitor <laughs> yeah you're the uh, he's not the first visitor to the moon though maybe the person who made that sign uh, they got uh, they got got by the stuff that chases after gumby and gumbo but then i'm thinking like when you're sitting down to write this short cloaky is not thinking of like a three-act structure so like gumby he's on the moon now he can explore the moon what happens next things explode for no reason including yeah. his ship so just <laughs> these cartoonish explosions again just drawn on film start going off all over the place and one explodes his ship so <laughs> the plotting is just so weird in this cartoon it feels like he was told like he just knew at minute x i need to end this part one and get ready for part two it's like well then a thing explodes i don't know there that now howdy duty can come in and start talking <laughs> can start advertising cigarettes or something so mm. Yeah, the ship, it's just so weird because the ship um, explodes. Gumby runs away from the explosion towards all of these like triangle-shaped rocks. He like is all hunched over on one and he's panting. And then he leans against it. And this is when we start getting this this alien fun time stuff where these aliens are creepy as hell. Oh, yeah. And seemingly they want to murder Gumby. Yeah, what is their plan exactly? I It also feels like the, they're a combination of Pokey and Prickle. Like they're, <laughs> they're orange uh, like Pokey and they kind of have his dot eyes but they're the pyramid shape of a prickle instead i think from this short cloaky was like oh yeah gumpy interacts well with brown things let's uh, find him a brown <laughs> thing to interact with outside of his dad to go back to gumby dharma real quick there was one other bit that i was like wow this is really weird where he's talking about how he like stopped loving his wife or something and then they show a scene of goo like saying i'm not gonna let you go anywhere and Ooh. like it holds and she's holding gumby in place so i was like okay all right so goo was the stand-in for ruth cloaky maybe yeah maybe it's sometimes for him yeah but like the again the logic for this is so weird because gumby's like oh my ship just got blown up i think i'll relax against this jagged rock yeah. and then eyeballs <laughs> pop out of the rock and they and the rock scoots backwards and then gumby's like oh I'll, i guess i'll scoot backwards too not realizing it's a living thing That's and then cute. it's just like well yeah gumby's next step after being stranded on the moon let's just sit down for a bit uh, <laughs> yeah, you know you gotta think sometimes yeah. you just have to be like all right let's think about this <laughs> but then he like uh he's done relaxing he walks around the rock he's like what's going on with this rock and that's when the eye stalks pop out and the rock starts following him and he's again there are lots of these triangular rocks that are actually creatures and they all start coming to life around him also with knowing how early this was for him it's impressive how many shots he has of like you know not that the rock people move around all that much but to see gumby and like a dozen other figures on screen like that's a lot to move around in one shot even if they are just like they there's not much articulation to these little pyramids that chase him yeah and they all start coming to life as i said and i have more of the uh the nightmarish sound design oh uh, of the moon so let's hear what's going on on the moon And really weird wow there i do like there's a little comedy of it's a bunch of orange guys and then there's one little orange triangle like bring it up the rear i guess to cut down on the horror there's like a little scrawny one always trailing behind yeah but yeah, yeah. they've just surrounded gumby and uh, he gets an idea to escape he uh takes off his gravity belt throws it and then because he's lighter he just jumps over to it he just like 
happily walks away but of course they just follow after him in this conga line <laughs> yeah i like the action and the actual you know idea of physics that gummy's like oh i can magically super jump away if i take off my belt and at this point in the uh in the short i it feels like it was made chronologically because they're like <laughs> god making gumby walk sucks and it looks bad and it's hard and this is when he really starts skating around although there is one shot of him like from a distance running in the background it looks so awkward oh yeah yeah now what as soon as he started doing his foot slide which i love him sli- skating around like it looks like he's a kid on and roller goes, skates like yeah that. there's something i definitely as a kid really thought about that like weird sound of like it's almost like he has pads of butter on his feet except it's is that the sound of his own like foot skin be sliding Ugh. against the ground it's like homer sliding on the oil <laughs> uh yeah and like so there's not a lot of gags it's just him being chased by these things and then like oh things are getting dull what if another thing explodes so then this literal <laughs> like cartoon asteroid drawn on the film comes in and blows a crater in the ground and yeah. that's when the ground starts to split open i guess yeah most of his time it seems like cloaky's idea of like well how do i make something exciting again could another asteroid show up i think it happens four times an asteroid shows up to cause something interesting to happen and it splits the earth open in a cool effect and gumby gets away by uh you know using his legs to push the ground open even more so the cat is something that they can't cross real but, super strength on gumby there <laughs> yeah he's powerful but the weird thing is about the plotting of this and again it's a gumby cartoon but still like as soon as he escapes from these guys they're immediately on him again this bought yeah. him like five seconds of time yeah it's it's uh not the best yeah it's like give him a second well this is where dialogue could actually help where he's like Phew, i think i made it oh no they got around the canyon these are just say these words yeah, yeah. otherwise it's like well then why did you do that so yeah they find him again and he hides behind a rock. And this is when we see Gumby framed by like a circular frame. And that's when we know that his parents are watching him. And this is when we get some of the brief bits of dialogue <laughs> in this cartoon done by the Clokies. Yep. He's on the moon, all right. I've got to go after him. <gasps> that's it. Wow. I, I love the very, yep. He's on the moon, all right. I better go after him. <laughs> not too worried. No, no. I mean, again, Cloakie's not an actor either, so... He's better as Pokey, I will say that. Oh, yeah. You know what? He really feels himself as Pokey, and, like, uh, the, the smart assiness talks to him more than just Gumbo, like, in Robot Rumpus as well. He's just like, oh, no, Gumby. Well, <laughs> you're in trouble. He's very, yeah. very flat. <laughs> uh, also, just uh, when he says, yep, he's on the moon, all right, his back is to camera, so no lip sink needed there <laughs> yeah moving those little like uh, clay squiggles around is hard yeah and this is where i think gumby gets the weirdest and just, <laughs> just our cloaky being really literal about this it's like well what happens to gumby now well gumby's on the moon gumby's really cold and gumby's gonna die Gumby That's what is happens. gonna freeze to death and you're gonna have to watch it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we see Gumby, it's like the fun is over in the cartoon because now it's a rescue effort. Gumby is on the moon. He is like his like he's like sitting against this uh, cliff face, he's rubbing his hands together, blowing in them, like rubbing his body. Gumby is going to freeze to death. He's dying. Like he's it's it's a real weird place to take your very first cartoon uh, for children. <laughs> and this is what Gumby has to say. <laughs> in case you were wondering uh there's so many other things where i wanted more explanation but this was the one time he's like no he needs to say boy it's cold if you can't tell from my movements i'm cold <laughs> you could tell definitely i don't know why he thought we needed that dialogue yeah <laughs> but then like the aliens are upon him once again and then we get a weird fade to uh, gumbo in his fire truck so maybe that's where the short ended originally maybe it's a weird like yeah i and it's like modern editing or more modern editing technique that they would not have had access to in 56 i would think yeah and this is when gumbo he uh, has his fire truck to rescue gumby and this is where the whimsy continues because like i just love the just very childlike and dreamlike uh, logic where it's like well how does gumby get rescued well his dad's got a fire truck he's gonna put a ladder all the way up to the moon and rescue gumby like i just love how just like it's what a kid would think of. yeah like a four-year-old would think well the you know as a little kid you don't think this ladder can't go thousands of miles into the sky but you just as a kid you think well yeah it's a ladder it goes up and it can go there and what do Ladders you need to go run out sorry and what do you need to go in outer space a parka put yes. on your 
parka. You're going uh, to space. I love seeing the uh, fuzz on that move around in shots. I know it's like looks like amateurish, but I kind of like how weird it is. That's like on on King Kong when the fur would like jump around and yeah, stuff. I think yeah. they wanted to do that on uh, Were Rabbit as well when we covered that for what a cartoon movie. All right, yeah, but they had to keep it more tamped down, which is too bad. I I I also when I was thinking of the childishness of sending something to the moon, that's also what happens in one of the earliest Dragon Ball comics like Goku uses his pole to just send this oh, rabbit right. guy like ah, I'm just gonna send him to the moon there you go no like, more guy <laughs> again more fun childish logic and so Gumbo goes up this ladder he's confronted with the evil asteroid and what I love again more dreamlike childlike logic it's like how do you get rid of an asteroid well I brought this spray can I'll spray the <laughs> asteroid until it presumably dies I don't know it has a face in the shot of him spraying the spray can is just somebody with two mittens holding oh, it man. just a live action shot I wish they would have done that more it's so weird and cool i love i love how weird that is yeah that you and when you look at it you know it's not clay holding it anymore like it's it's mittens on a thing that's spraying in a non-stop motion way yeah it's it's distracting in its strangeness and i guess there actually is some consistency though to the idea that well if gumby freezes to death gumbo then needs a parka to stay warm in space yeah this yeah. is something i noticed with the uh, shorts when they were packaged because some would have different realities than others and the early shorts there was this weird thing called the gumbometer yes. in that gumby couldn't get too hot or cold because so many of the old shorts were like yes he's made out of clay and that that defines who he is and what he can do later it's just like well he's just a boy right yeah. <laughs> he happens to be made of clay but he's just a boy but in this one it's like gumby gets too cold we need to revive gumby we need to bring gumby back to life at the start of the first one with pokey like the mother says to him don't forget your gumbometer exactly stay too cold yeah there's just something so cool and morbid about a character a main character who has like a meat thermometer you stick in his head to make sure he's alive <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, who like can't even have ice cream I, well, I think that's probably why they got rid of it they're like well we want him to have ice cream and have fun <laughs> again uh, gumbo's going up to space with this ladder and then he kills an asteroid with his spray his magic spray <laughs> and then we cut back to what gumby was doing and he's pulling the same trick again he's throwing his gravity belt and then jumping towards it and uh so what happens next is he rolls into a ball i'm surprised they didn't go for like a bowling gag but that feels like it would be hard to animate where he rolls yeah. into a ball and, like rolls down the hill yeah it at least gets him around it but you're right it should be a 10 pin joke but that that does sound pretty hard for his first film and gumby ends up like going off a ramp into a crater so now gumby is even more fucked like he's not oh. only freezing to death but he's also like stranded in a crater man seeing him try to climb up and fail i'm like oh this is depressing it's just very sad Sad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, more comments by Gumby. It's so cold here. I'm getting stiff. So Gumby is getting stiff. <laughs> He's getting stiff, is he? <laughs> it's so morbid because at this point he like slumps against the side of the crater. He's like... <sighs> He's dying. Yeah. He's like he's either if he doesn't freeze to death first, those uh those guys are gonna corner him and kill him too. And uh Gumbo is pulling closer to the moon on his ladder, and again, it's more like the moon is so cool, we don't even know what's on the moon. So just lots of shots of the moon, just like a pan across this landscape that they made as he's looking for Gumby. Well, and, and all these slow pans, like they do remind me of the mandala stuff from uh mm -hmm. of just like long pans over landscapes, basically, but landscapes made out of plastic plastic and clay yeah and just like giving you time to really take it in like i'm looking at a bunch of weird stuff and i love another whimsical touch in that uh gumby's in the crater and then gumbo is coming in from the top of the screen upside down it's a That's very great. cool touch yeah and and the reality that the mood men kind of need to steady themselves and like tie themselves into uh, ropes around each other yeah. to carefully get down they're rappelling down to murder gumby yeah <laughs> uh, especially they see gumbo showed up they're like uh oh we get, we're not gonna get to kill this guy if we're not fast so there's some questions and answers between Gumbo and Gumby. Hey, Dad! I'm down here! How did you get up there? Hold on, son. I'm coming. So 
So yes, Ugh. Gumbo's coming down. Hurry, Dad! I yeah. think I think that's a real kid. It's not the guy who would eventually voice Gumby. I think they got one of their kids for this pilot. I think so. Yeah, it sounds. It doesn't sound like that. Uh, also, very old man they interviewed in Gumby Dharma <laughs> with a it. big beard. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, also like his big old hat too. Like when they showed him briefly, I was like, "You hired the prospector to be Gumby." Like, <laughs> He does not look like the voice of Gumby, by the no, way. No, no, he does not. So Gumbo gets in the crater. Uh, obviously, the stone creatures are down in there, but Gumbo doesn't know that they're uh, pretending to be stone, as Gumby says. Look out! They're only t- pretending to be stone! And Gumbo has a kick-ass action hero moment in that he, like, freezes the creatures, and it's like, oh, they're dead, but they come back to life. I'm li- I like that it's not that morbid. It was like, oh, you killed these things? Like, no, they pop back to life, and then they're, like, afraid, and they run away. <laughs> I guess it's, it's definitely better than killing them. Also, like, I'd be sad that you know you came to their place guys like you invaded their place so uh, you you shouldn't get to kill them in self-defense but yeah like you're totally right earlier in that it's like who are gumpy's friends his parents and then thinking of this as the pilot like what does what does gumpy do his dad saves him that's yes, what gumpy yeah. does so very very funny and morbid i sent this uh, image to nina of just like gumpy so he chatters he straight up dies and there's a shot of gumpy just dead on rocks with x's for eyes it uh. is creepy as hell hell and the rest of the short is about bringing gumby to a hospital to resurrect him it's uh when he died at that point in it in my first watch i was like no there's too much time left in this he can't be dead here and i yeah that reaction shot of him dead it's even crazier to then cut to gumbo not looking that worried at his dead son on the moon like, it's happened before i guess yeah i guess he's been through a lot of this before but jesus and just like carrying his gumpy's corpse onto the ladder of course we don't see how he gets onto the ladder with the corpse mm, yeah that that part seems a little harder to do but but the shot so it's a live action shot not stop motion of the gumbo holding gumby with x's for eyes on the ladder and it's like shakily moving out of frame right. and then the center of the frame is a baby doll's head planet uh, out of focus which uh, makes it even creepier oh so weird so yeah all the other planets around the moon they're also disturbing like they all have these like scrunched doll faces like (laughs) and then we immediately smash cut to this really cool lo-fi effect of we can see gumby on a gurney with presumably his mother going up a very long elevator but it's a a, it's a side shot of the hospital in silhouette so they can basically make you think this hospital is huge based on how they're filming it oh man the like cavernous hallway of the hospital they're walking down and that it's his like own mother walking him down the in the hospital hallways like to treat him the shot okay this is fucking like kubrick stuff this is the shining <laughs> when they're going down this hospital hallway and i think Cloaky wants you to be a little creeped out because what's going to happen to gumby but just the way this hallway is lit the endless corridor the endless door how at the end of the corridor just blackness as gumby is being wheeled down and all the entire time you hear another creepy soundscape <laughs> So this is what you hear as Gumby's corpse is being wheeled down an endless hallway with blackness uh, at the end. This is not like, welcome to Doll Hospital. Let's check your goofy levels. <laughs> it's just like, no, Gumby needs to be slid into an iron lung. We uh, need to give Gumby oxygen. We need to check his levels. And it's just so like disturbing and like dreamy too, or, or nightmarish of, I mean, I feel like it's a nightmare where you have sleep paralysis and you're frozen yes. as Gumby and your mother is pushing you down a dark hallway. Like it's all so hard. Horrifying. No, you're right. The first Gumby short is a sleep paralysis nightmare. <laughs> uh, and I mean, too, like being placed in an iron lung. I I wondered if this one would get shown less just because it's such dated medical stuff, too, even in the late 80s. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, she brings him to this iron lung room or whatever the hell this machine is. And there are this, these weird things drawn on the walls. These, like, surreal, like, animal shapes. It's so yeah. weird and unsettling. And, like, dad comes in. I believe he's preferred to as Dr. Gumbo and those weird garbled announcements over the PA. And then they start working like the Gumby revival machine. Yeah, it's also uh, so odd that like the parents who are just normal parents up to this point in it 
now they become, you know, doctors. They're like, well, there's no other person in this world, so we're <laughs> doctors now. And how long this goes on without, like, gags? It's like, okay, uh, they put the oxygen mask on Gumby and, like, the mom's, like, motioning, no, give them more, and it's all silent, and it's, well, I mean, there's a soundscape, but yeah. they're still, like, you know, they're turning cranks and pulling levers, and she's getting stuff to dab his head with. It's it's so just literal at this point. Like, here is the procedure we need to resurrect Gumby. It's not magic. It is... I mean, it's kind of magic, but it's still like you're seeing similar things you would see in a real hospital. And they take time with each thing. So, to a degree, it might have been like filler to get to a time, like uh, an amount of time he needed to hit because he's like, well, I, I already got him off the moon. I really need to go three more minutes. But I mean, Gumby in the Iron Lung is so weird. And then it turns into like a Frankenstein, a Dr. Yeah. Frankenstein machine. He's being like cooked like a shrinky dink or something because yeah. uh, they activate this uh, lightning, like a Tesla coil, and it jumps from coil to coil across the room into the Gumby oven. He's being roasted in essentially, <laughs> at least the bottom half. And they're just peering in the window as like creepy lights are coming out of it. This is really weird. It's so weird. I the, the only cut in the tension you get in this is when Gumbo like winks like, hey, it's okay. I, like a little a little playful wink after all this weirdness. Yeah, a moment of levity as it's like, I think Gumby, uh, these these parents now have lost their child. Yeah. And another another fun morbid thing, like the mom jams the meat thermometer in his head it's like oh he's a cold turn up the electricity honey and he, he trudges over and he does that it's like jab like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a gumbometer for you you got to get in deep you got to hit the brain matter <laughs> but yeah it's just like it's a long slow scene of like levers being pulled and meters being shown and characters looking at equipment and like winks at each other and nods at each other and i, I do like the shot of how the lightning coming off of that like i guess like lightning rod thingy like mm -hmm. the that electricity bit is is really interesting to see done in stop motion too i like that yeah and eventually uh, the gumbometer says gumby is perfect and of course we have to shut all the machines off let's not let me show that yes, or, yeah or otherwise how do we know and we take the <laughs> we take the oxygen mask off of gumby and that's when he wakes up and they're very happy and i'll play the clip again because it's like the longest gumby dialogue in the entire cartoon i was on the moon but i'm sure glad mother and that's uh, what gumby says it, it wouldn't be gumby if he didn't say mother yes. like he has to he's a proper good boy who says mother and yeah a father and because gumby's a little gingerbread shit boy in this early <laughs> cartoon the second he is uh, alive he gets on a gurney and like skateboards down the kubrick hallway and they're like gumby gumby yeah oh, he didn't learn his lesson at all that gumby so i like this little stinker gumby who's just like time for another <laughs> fun uh, goof him up scrape with gumby and that's the end of the cartoon is gumby just like cruising down this uh creepy hospital hallway in this uh on this gurney i do uh another thing i'd suggest could be a funny reaction gif is gumby sliding out of that tube <laughs> the way he just like he, he like through no physical action he's just like whoop like friday's just, got me like yeah <laughs> just head first sliding out of his zoop. tube yeah, yeah. uh and uh, if i must steal one more thing from mst3k mike nelson points out on that the end screen gumby's head knob turns to the wrong side oh like, you're right it's a reversed image but my, mike nelson pointed that out i'm just stealing it from a him. cloaky production but yeah that is the origins of Gumby. The second short, I believe, is the one where he goes to Mirror World or whatever. It's it's uh it's almost as unsettling, and they're still having fun with like Gumby in a surreal world, getting mutilated and deformed and, yes. and dying. But soon after that, it becomes a little more domestic. Gumby's in school. Gumby's got a house. Once but, he has Pokey to talk to, things yeah. get helped a bit too dialogue wise. Yeah, I think that helps, but. This early stuff, like, boy, I wish Art Cloakie could have just done this for the rest of his life. Just, like, surreal and disturbing Gumby shorts. This is what he was made to do. This kind of yeah. art is what he was put on this earth to do. Go to the 60 shorts, the 80 shorts. They're technically better, but it's. I think it's a little too goody-goody wholesome entertainment for me. I like it as, as outsider art or of just, like, this is an artist expressing himself. That's what's so interesting to me. Uh, sadly, 
uh, especially you know in the 50s and 60s that's not what he could do like i'd i would love to think of a world where art cloaky could just be on patreon and be like hey every every six months i'm gonna make a new short get, and i get like ten thousand a month on it or whatever. like that uh like that worthy kids guy who makes yeah. those weird shorts i love those and he does them as stop motion but with a 3d program but they look like stop motion they're so great yeah i i'd love to see what cloaky could do with uh you know computer tools now too but uh you know for his time he made some memorably unsettling stuff you're right it gets less interesting when he tries to be more mainstream in what what is considered kids entertainment he's yep. he's much better of just like long soundscapes long hallways unhappy faces and in silence and death De- and death <laughs> dead God. gumbies as far as the eye can see so much death but yes i know this is not a typical gumby short I know most of the cast is missing. Pokey's not even in it, but I feel like this is peak Gumby for me. And yes, uh, there's not a lot of dialogue. And again, it helps to watch the short. But for me, I want to look at this one because I feel like knowing what I know about our Cloakie now, I feel like this is as close to who he is as any Gumby short is. And I hope you enjoyed our little look at the world of Gumby. It's whimsical. It's fun. <laughs> and there's a meat thermometer jammed in your head to make sure you're OK <laughs> periodically. Uh, and, and thank you again to patron James for picking this one out. We uh, we had a lot of fun. Thank you for giving us permission to do Gumby. Yes. Uh, so as for us, if you want to be cool like James and get all these episodes one week ahead of time and ad free please go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons sign up at the five dollar level you'll get just that but also access to everything behind the five dollar paywall that includes all of our limited miniseries the most recent one was talk king of the hill season two part one that it was 11 new episodes of our talk king of the hill king of the hill podcast retrospective and there are so many other things going on behind the paywall when you sign up you get everything access to everything we've made for the past over four years now of this patreon immediately you can listen to hundreds of hours of podcasts you've never heard before and there is also a ten dollar level when you sign up for that you get all the five dollar stuff but also access to one mega long podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher and what is that henry bob is talking about the what a cartoon movie podcast if you enjoy this podcast but wish we talked about animated feature films and for often twice or even three times as long you should sign up to hear the full versions of What a Cartoon Movie each month at the $10 level. This month, you'll get to hear us talk about the 25th anniversary of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Before that, you heard us talk about the Hercules Disney film from 1997. And before that, Cool World. We really had some uh, fun crapping on that movie. If you sign up now, you can get the entire What a Cartoon Movie Back catalog, over 130 hours of exclusive podcasts, in addition to all of the $5 things Bob just mentioned that you will find on patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Films as varied as Akira to a goofy movie and everything in between. Please check it out at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So as for me, I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. My other podcast, by the way, is Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast about old video games. Find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts. Sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month. Henry, what about you? I'm Henry Gilbert, and you should follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Stay up to date with what's going on in my life. And if you want to know what's going on with the What a Cartoon podcast or the Talking Simpsons podcast, Podcast, please follow the official Twitter account at Talk Simpsons Pod. At Talk Simpsons Pod will keep you up to date on what a cartoon schedules, on upcoming things we're going to do when Patreon or Pod free version episodes go live. It's all at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. Thank you so much for listening, folks. We'll see you next time for our extended free preview of our What a Cartoon Movie episode on The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and we'll see you then. Yeah.